Reporting started. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Tuesday, February 22nd, and our guest today is John Seeley Brown. JSB, really appreciate your being here today. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad to do this. So the Future of Education is sponsored by my employer, Illuminate. The project I work on is called Learn Central. It's a free social network for educators that has Illuminate baked in. It's at learncentral.org. Coming up on the Future of Education tomorrow, a little bit earlier than usual, Steve Wheeler is going to talk about Web 2.0 and learning. Uh, you'll look, if, you've, if you um, tried to attend the Kevin Kelly session, you'll know that he had to reschedule. And he is on for March 7th. Um, some new additions here. David Shank, uh, April 19th, The Genius in All of Us is his book. He's going to come on. I think we've talked about Hugh McGuire from LibriVox coming on. And then I think uh, on May 24th, Steve Denning is going to talk about radical management. And JSB, is he a co-author of yours for a previous book? Yeah, a book on storytelling. He's a great guy. I thought, I thought that was the case. Uh, if you've missed a session, they are all recorded. Last week we talked to David Perkins on Making Learning Whole. That was really fun. Uh, Wayne McIntosh before that, Karen Hume, David Wiley, Karen Cater, Michael Horn, lots of fun guests. They're all recorded both in the full Illuminate versions and the MP3 files at uh, futureofeducation.com. Coming up at the Q and ISTE shows, lots of fun sort of crowdsourced uh, social media activities. Um, both Q and ISTE have EduBlogger cons. Uh, the Q Edu Blogger Con is March 16th. The Philadelphia one is the full day on June 25th. That's always a really fun event. Uh, we'll have Bloggers Cafe, and both will have unplugged areas where you can present. If you've never presented at either of those shows or you didn't get accepted, you can present in our unplugged areas, and we stream those out live by Illuminate. If this is your first time in Illuminate, it is a participative environment. I'm going to recommend the first thing you do is go up to View Layouts and switch yourself to the Wide Layout. It will let you see the chat just a little bit better. At the bottom of the participant window, you'll notice a smiley face, a clapping hand, um, a confused look or a thumbs down. You can use those at any time during the session. You can also put notes in the chat. When we go to Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question with the microphone, look for the hand with the green up arrow. That's at the bottom of the participant window. That lets you raise your hand. We'll give you the mic, and you can ask a question. So now we're going to let you indicate where you're participating from. To the left of the map, look for a wand with a red star at the end. Click on that and click on the map. It's fun if you do a shout out in the chat as well. time, the temperature, anything you want to tell us about where you are. A nice diverse crowd for you today, JSB. <laughs> Fantastic. It's always fun to have someone from China. Wherever you're listening from, we sure appreciate your joining us. And if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much. I noticed a couple coming in from New Zealand, so I hope things are okay over there. Yes, uh, it, uh, we, we've been thinking about those in New Zealand all day today. And certainly as well those who are in Arab countries in the Middle East, which I think will be maybe a little bit of our story today. So this book was really fun for me. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And I wondered if, to some degree, this is sort of the uh, answer to the dilemma in pull that, uh, that, uh, that we have this need to change existing institutions, and that in this book, you're, you're specifically looking at, the, at transforming the institution of education. Correct. Although I would call it transforming how we think about learning as well. Yeah, it felt to me as though one of the themes in the book is uh, we can't, that we'll, we'll sort of dive into the rationale, but uh, we don't want to be throwing education away, that this is an institution that needs to be transformed. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think in two ways. Let me map it back to the poll comment you made, because you know the fundamental thesis that, that John Hagel and I have been pushing for several years 
is that in the corporate world, um, you transform the firm by um, focusing on the edge and beefing up the edge in a way that it, through social media and through cloud computing, can do so many amazing things that it starts to pull the core to the edge. As you know, I came from running Xerox Palo Research Center. We were a core, we were an edge entity in the old days, up to like five years ago. Corporations kept thinking like, let's build up the edge and then let the core appropriate the edge. But the immune system in the core kills anything really happening on the edge. So basically that mode uh, or that mechanism for transforming the corporations actually didn't work very well. So we decided to flip that entire equation inside out and say, no, no, um, we can do things on the edge today that are so incredibly powerful uh, that build up the edge and let the edge attract the core to it. Now, in the world of education, this also holds true. In that sense, the edge, in many ways, is after-school programs, what's happening in the ecology, you know, around the school, because after all, a kid doesn't spend his entire life in school, but lives in, in, the, in, in the town, in the city, and so on and so forth. So in some sense, the hope was if you could actually get more serious um, and demonstrable learning and creation, going in the, uh, in the edge, almost always with mentorship. And I would say the one thing that is, comes throughout this book is emphasizing the role of mentorship, but not just authority-based mentorship, but peer-based mentorship as well. But if you can get the edge really high performing, all of a sudden the core, that is the central school system, starts to take notice. And they begin to see kids who they thought were completely turned off coming into class asking questions. And I've seen this in South Chicago now a bunch of times, that the, uh, by building up very successful multimedia um, after-school programs, uh, these kids got alive, came alive, and all of a sudden the teachers started asking, how did this happen? These kids are sleeping through my class. Now they're actually asking questions. And so that whole sense of trying to find ways to um, let the uh, edge take on more power, to empower the edge, let me say, and then let people observe what happens when that happens, sometimes in a very efficient way to change the core. I think one of the interesting themes we've seen through the interview series is the kind of parallel nature between the student experience and the educator experience. And as I heard you talking about the edge there, speaking about students, I'm thinking in my mind also of the many ways in which educators are going through the same kind of process themselves through social networking, through live events like this, where they're getting reengaged and also then informing the core. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I go one step further, you know, and I'm sure the, the participants here know this is at least as well as I do, uh, and I know you do, Steve. Um, is in a curious sort of way, when you move to a full inquiry method, um, teachers classically have been hesitant to do that because they're coming from an authority-based point of view. And what happens if the kids ask them a question that they can't answer? Oh, they look stupid, they look silly, they look like they're not uh, the authority that they're supposed to be. Whereas in today's world, with the incredible power tools that we have at our disposal, both teacher and student, the best thing that can happen is the teacher now says, hey, let's look at this together. Let's get on the net. Uh, let's go try to figure this thing out. Let me become like the reference librarian and I help you know, guide you to discovering and I'm going to discover it's the same. And by the way, if you do this very often, you suddenly find that the kids are better nav navigators than you are in finding things out. So suddenly you become co-learners uh, and co-explorers in this method. And so you're learning together and that becomes actually powerful and fun for both. So Chris in the chat put a comment. He says, it's strange to me. It seems like the core is pushing technology into the classroom without knowing what that means. It does feel in many ways like the technology is bringing with it you know, somewhat dramatic changes in the same way that other technologies have. Um, and are you watching um, the Arab world and seeing the same kind of, um, sort of shift in voice and power 
uh, that, that uh, is, you know, to some degree is being described in your work? Well, you know, in the Arab world, we're actually seeing a, a, a massively nonlinear phenomenon that happened. So we're seeing dramatic change over a two or three week period. Um, I think what you find in the um, in, in the world of education, probably a more steady um, change going on that um, is probably going to be a little bit easier to stay on top of. I'm not kind of 100 percent sure of that, but but you know when the question came in about uh, Chris, I guess it was that um, asked about technology being pushed into the core. You know, both you, Steve, and, and I, you know, often say that it's not the technology we're talking about; it's the practices that are enabled around that technology. Um, and so, technology by itself is kind of useless and often misleading. And the real question is, how do you actually provide the room for both students and teachers and mentors to kind of figure out the new practices that make this stuff come alive? And you know, there's not the room, I mean, we aren't giving space for mucking around, or as Mimi Ito might say, uh, messing around in order to figure out how, um, how to kind of find the sweet spot for each of us relative to the genres we're used to in teaching and participation or the school system itself. So in the book, there's you set up this tension between uh, freedom and st structure, uh, and you use the word culture, which sort of brilliantly divides itself into two def different definitions that really help to magnify that distinction. Do you want to talk a, a little bit about the word culture and how you're using it in the context of the book? Yeah, it's actually meant as a, a pun. In fact, the original cover of the book was going to be a petri dish. But we couldn't get get the rights to the particular picture we wanted. <laughs> um, but you know, we think of learning as much more what happens inside a petri dish, where there are it is a bounded environment with incredibly powerful nutrients, where cross pollination and things happen, exploration happens, but it is an emergent property, and that that sense of constant change um, is what we're up to. Um, and so instead of kind of a very stylized form of, of, of learning, we actually really see um, much more the kind of freedom to play and counter um, in a Petri dish. But the catch of a Petri dish and a key to our theory uh, in terms of the notion of structure and agency um, as we kind of introduced this topic is the fact that boundaries matter. And when I first hit this in a very major way, I was over in Bilbao um, um, looking at Frank Gehry's beautiful museum over there. And I was stunned to find that when uh, he first took on the commission, the, the city fathers offered him this magnificent open space on, on the hill overlooking the city. And he said, no. I want to build something in the inner guts of the city where there were untold number of constraints. And then what he did is he actually transformed these constraints into resources uh, as a creative act to build that fantastic museum. Um, and I've always been struck uh, that a definition of an architect is one who can transform constraints into resources. And coming from that dispositional stance is not too surprising when I look at things like Lord of Warcraft, um, what I see in these massively um, multiplayer strategic games are the kids that are really good are the ones that transform, again, constraints into resources, can engage in bricolage, can find new ways to use things in, brand, you know, in, in unexpected ways, and so on and so forth. So I think that whole spirit of uh, what happens in a petri dish, what happens as an architect looks at a problem, what happens when you go on a quest in World of Warcraft, all start to come together in a form of amplifying a sense of personal agency in order to make things happen, but to understand that boundaries are there um, and that you have to work with them, but they can become resources in a very powerful way. So that to me 
me was some of the brilliance of the book, the you know culture as the the more stable, and then culture as change, and, and the idea of creating systems that embrace change processes, um, and and that sort of took me into your argument: schools aren't broken because an environment can't be broken. Right. We're growing a solution. Did I get that right? Yeah, absolutely. If we could get to that point of view, um, these changes may be fairly simple with this reframing. But you know, we have confused scalable efficiency, in which everything is lockstepped into looking at how do we construct petri dishes, leveraging the nutrients, and leveraging the power of the collective um, to help each other. And so. You know, I, I sometimes laugh in one of my kind of final slides in a lot of my talks is a slide that says, back to the future, the one-room schoolhouse. And think about what the one-room schoolhouse really is, is basically the teacher becomes an orchestrator, a coordinator, a mentor, but one who, and a coach, but one who is actually skilled at getting older students to help younger students um, and older students to learn from yet older students. So in a one-room schoolhouse, you know, each kid might spend half his or her time teaching somebody else, and also the other half of the time learning from someone. But of course, these completely fold in on each other because we all know in this group um, that the best way to learn something is to have to teach it. So there's something kind of magical in that highly, in, you know, encapsulated one-room schoolhouse that became a little more like a petri dish. But unfortunately, back 100 years ago in the United States, um, you know, we didn't have access to the infinite world of tools, computation, and information that we do today. So you know, today, we could re-implement that with amazingly powerful tools. And, you know, I like to think um, you know, that Dewey was um, you know, decades ahead of his time, and then what we have to do is kind of go back to the core philosophy of Dewey and reinvent um, some of his deepest ideas, his philosophic ideas, to begin to understand this notion of structure and agency, and now how we have the tools to be able to do collectively amazingly real things that we can learn from and in response to building these things. So I think one of the frustrations that I often hear, and, and, and probably hear myself to some degree, is the, the nature of the public discourse or political discourse around education, which seems to move us away from this sense of creating structures to provide freedom and seems to be much more about control. Are you there? Yeah, sorry, I didn't really ask a question, but I was curious as to your sort of oh, sense okay. of the current political dialogue. Um, um, this this uh, sense of testing and controlling seemed to me to be sort of diametrically opposed to the kinds of things you're talking about. Yeah, I think they are. Now, you know, um, on the other hand, let me tip my hat slightly to the fact that um, you know, we have to be able to show what we've accomplished. Now, you know, taking the standardized test is something that, you know, being trained to take these tests is, is, is pathetic. Um, um, you know, and a lot of us push much more for, you know, how do you construct a portfolio of things that you have done that actually show what you've been able to create. Um, and you know, let me be represented by the things that I have created, perhaps shared with others who maybe have even built more things on them. So it's kind of like I am what I've created, shared, and others have built on. And the more we create that spirit, the more education and learning starts to take on a life of its own. I think that the um, you know the key that that got me going on this and underlie, of course, the power of pool, um, is we have moved into a world um, of constant or exponential change, which simply means that the uh, half-life of any particular skill 
has moved from 30 years down to maybe five years or less. Um, now, what does that mean? Does that mean we should all go back to school or community college or whatever trade schools or training departments um, every five years? Well, of course not. Um, what we really need to do is to learn, in fact, how to embrace change, very much like a gamer does. I'll come back to that in a moment. But how do we constantly turn everything we're doing into learning opportunities? And we tend to do that by reflecting in practice. And that reflection in practice is amplified through the collective, through working with others, listening to others, and so on. Um, and so teachers and students alike need to have kind of learn how to listen with humility, but listen to humility not just to others, but to the pushbacks of the situation. You know, when I can't get a particular algorithm to work or make a certain kind of new type of material at the atomic level, um, it, not in schools, but as a scientist, uh, you know, you learn to listen to what nature is pushing back at you. How do you interpret those things? And so learning is fundamentally an interpretive act of pushbacks as well. And I think if we can instill that, we would be, um, you know, really off and running in this Cambrian moment, moving from a world of stability to a world of perpetual flux and change. And I think that, you know, why I got into this originally is by studying the hardcore World of Warcraft gamers who have a very simple mantra. Their mantra is, if I ain't learning, it ain't fun. And on top of that, um, the gamers build incredibly complex dashboards that measure their own performance in all kinds of different ways. They mash these dashboards up, but they mash them up and the dashboards are for them, not for teachers, not for bosses or managers, but for them to amplify their ability to learn. And I've even kind of taken this idea to the Obama administration and said, you know, what would it mean to start voting for the government? Let people in the government build their own dashboards so they begin to kind of get a sense of how are they spending their time? Where are they spending their time? How much are they actually learning? How much are they actually getting done? And make it just for them and make it as mashups. Uh, so, you know, they can tailor it as they want. Um, and gamers, by the way, do that all the time. I can't kind of read a mashed up uh, dashboard of somebody that, that I am not playing with or that I didn't do myself. So you're you're reminding those of us who've been in many of these interviews of the kind of the the theme that we've had of Deming and the total quality movement and the degree to which the measurement was put in the hands of the workers and a lot of great themes. But I but I get stuck a little on the measurement piece. Because I think we've had progressive schools that have done a lot of these things very well over many decades. But we don't have any good way of sort of measuring the success of that. And the moment we even start to talk about success in sort of business terms, they don't, it doesn't feel like a compelling story. So how do we tell a story about success that would encourage these environments? Yeah, I, I think that. Um I go back to the notion of, first of all, a portfolio. And, you know, the student comes in and says, you know, or walks up to me and says, here are the things that I have done this year. And then I can sit down and discuss with that student what he or she did and what they learned from doing this and what didn't work and what they learned from things that didn't work. I have an infinitely better insight into that kid than I will from looking any looking at any set of tests, SATs or whatever you want to give me. Um, and so I think that, you know, we actually if we move away from scalable learning, a scalable you know, education, to understanding much more about how we take the time to understand the individual, um, that we can do all kinds of things. Now I think the catch is We've also moved to a world in which is much easier to demonstrate what we've done because we can build all kinds of new things so easily in the multimedia world, in the computation world, or even in terms of hard goods. So I think that, um, you know, with uh, things like Tech Shop down at Menlo Park that I'm sure you've talked about before. Um, so there's a sense that, that action has come back in. It's not just thinking, 
but it's kind of thinking in action, researching action. Um, you know, we're moving back almost more to how studios actually work, again, going back to architecture. Quote, I know I wrote it down, but I can't find it, where I think you essentially say, the moment you try and drive this from the top, you're missing the most important piece of it. And I've wondered about that for student portfolios. You know, I hear of these systems where, where we're going to create a, we're going to roll out a system of student portfolios, and I keep thinking, well, that doesn't allow the student to create their own portfolio. Here, here, um, and you know, and even have the students not only roll out their own, but also kind of even write essays around what they learn from doing this thing. So, you know, when I interview kids. Um, albeit I'm looking for researchers, but um, you know it's almost always not what he, just what you've done, but what did you learn from doing it, and maybe even more important, what didn't work, and how quickly did you detect it? How did you feel about that? How did you step back and reflect on that? You know, could you take more of a Zen-like quality of kind of just absorb it and move on, or did it paralyze you? I mean, so kind of, you know, there's kind of a, a psychosocial component here that we want to pay a little bit of attention to, you know, as well. But let me go back to one other thing very close to this, and, and the, um, the part that surprised a lot of people in the book is the emphasis we put on play. Now, you know, most of the audience, most of the people right now, uh, I'm sure, are well are familiar with why play is so important, but I think and I don't know if you saw it in the book, but we tried to unpack a different take on this. And the take is this, very briefly. Um, when kids get born into this world, uh, they've got to figure everything out. They've got to kind of find the frame through which the world becomes stabilized. And that is done through play, uh, usually the first two, three, four years. And, you know, they would sit there, whack them all over and over and over and over again for the American audience, uh, and play, you know, with a tremendously repetitive form, these, uh, a lot of very simple sensory motor games, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what they're actually doing is finding a way to make the world stable, uh, to find the frame of reference. Um, and then once they've gotten that frame of reference, then supposedly you go to school and have stuff poured into that frame. Okay, and that's the basic paradigm um, in shorthand. In a world of constant disruption, you've got to rebuild not the knowledge, but the frames. And how do you figure out the new reference frames? How do you figure out how to frame the world? It's almost like how do you grind new sets of lenses to make sense of the world? Well, guess what? You do that by playing. And we did it to begin with as kids playing, and now we actually have to think about playing again to do this. And if you look at the kind of the chapter that um, is a particular take on Mimi stuff and how do you move from hanging out to messing around to geeking out, that's a trajectory into helping a kid in, or any of us in a rapidly changing world to kind of find our orientation and then find our passion within that orientation in order to get going and make new things. And so I think that that, that sense of play that um, we all kind of know is important at some level now plays a fundamental epistemological role in the type of learning theory that Doug and I are articulating now. So what struck me about that and what strikes me about the difference between uh, culture as teaching and culture as learning or, or um, structure and freedom was the degree to which the process needs to be transparent and generative. The, you know, the learning to learn means you're describing the learning process as you're going along. Was that what you meant? Yeah, it, it is, but notice, um, you know, twice you have used the term structure and freedom. And I, we use the term structure and agency. And there's a subtle difference between agency and freedom. You know, agency is how do I imagine something that's a little bit different from where I am now? Uh, and what can I do about it? So agency, personal agency, says I can make a difference. 
And so that sense of what is the structure around me, again, like we talked about the Petri dish, that provides useful constraints that now been turned into resources to let me act, to let me try building things uh, and to learn from that or to actually make the world different. And so that sense of agency you know, has been kind of stripped away from the way we do um, schooling today. And when we say that, you know, we can bring agency back in force uh, with the kind of bounded environments that we're talking about. So good. I'm glad you clarified that. Um, would you, um, I'd love it if you talk a little bit about learning in collective and, and what that means and um, what the implications are. Well, the catch of the collective, um, you know, is how do I, when I'm stuck on something, do I go to, you know, one of the collectives that I, um, you know, tend to be a part of and ask a question um, and then get people to give me ideas of what I can do. Um, and so it's a sense of, you know, it's, it's an expansion of peer-based learning, but by helping me and seeing if it works, it actually makes the collective smarter as well. And so I think there's a kind of an interesting duality between the, the um, um, if what I'm taking, I mean, in some sense the purpose of the collective you might say is actually to make me smarter. Um, uh, and that's a, uh, you know, we, we wrote a little paper on our website about the difference between communities and collectives as two different ends of the spectrum here. But the sense of how does a collective, as a collective set of expertises or experiences, help me orient and figure out what I could do next? And then in return, what do I tell them back so that they get feedback and the collective constantly gets better? Um, so that's kind of a, a, a simple example of this. You know, a more complicated example and, and one that um, I finally ended up really adopting because everywhere I go, um, and I tend to talk to high tech audiences, um, you know, they keep saying, oh, John, uh, today's kids, um, they have no attention span, they can't read with a damn, and they can't write. Sure, they can go off and do wonderful things on Facebook, but that's about it. Uh, I can't tell you how many times it comes back. That kind of, I'm sure everyone in here has gotten that. And I say, whoa, whoa, guys, step back a moment. Let's look at something like Harry Potter. Okay. Harry Potter is a phenomenon that challenges, if not disrupts, almost all the popular beliefs about learning and attention spans. These kids can sit riveted on 600-page books, uh, the final ones, <laughs> big ones, uh, maybe not 600, but fat books. Um, they can absorb everything in those books. Years later, they can tell you everything about them. But more importantly, what's going on is they're not memorizing. They're not memorizing because what they're also doing is they're learning to be not just learning about Harry Potter, but they're going into discussion groups, almost always on the web. Some of them are building their own uh, wizard genre of music. A lot of them are trying to guess what the next volume of Harry Potter was going to be. You know, so huge discussion groups around that. Um, newspapers around this. There's an incredibly active knowledge economy around those books. And it is by being in and immersed in that knowledge economy that they are absorbing everything. So they are no longer just learning about, they are learning to be. They are in. They are learning, they are indwelling in the phenomena. They are a part of the phenomena. And they have learned things unbelievably well, unbelievably deep, and never ever thought about it as memorizing anything. And that's the kind of massive worldwide learning we're talking about. So we got a little bit of an audio delay from you, JSB, so you're going to notice it will catch up. Um, 
Well, yeah, having children who've read all of the Harry Potter novels and been been interested that my 12-year-old who read them a couple of years ago will, will tell me, well, they're all really good except for number five and then list off all the reasons. You know, I, I, I would completely agree. <laughs> yeah. um, so is some of that response kind of the, sort of the, the maybe almost the pathological response that institutions give when they see they're losing power? You're, you're not obeying, you're not doing the things the way we want you to do, so we're going to say that you're doing it badly? Um, I think what it may have more to do with the tasks we give kids today make no sense. And if they make no sense, no wonder they go to sleep. It's the same reason why many of the corporate meetings I'm in, I fall asleep. They make no sense. It's just people posturing or trying to, you know, drill in their pet term um, and you know, you just they, they drill on and on and on and it's just, you fall asleep. So I, I think we got a, 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 a dangerous gap between actually what makes sense to folks living in the flux of the digital world and the 20th and 19th century notions of what we needed to learn. And I think We've there's a very little understanding of just um, once you get a, um, a disposition that says, I, I, I embrace change, I want to play with change, I want to figure it out, then you can run for life. And so I think it's a shift from learning about to learning to be to learning to become. We're going to switch the Q&A uh, in about eight minutes, so I want to quickly go through a couple of other things, if that's okay. Um, in your chapter, We Know More Than We Can Say, you talk about explicit versus uh, tacit knowledge. And, and this is where it really felt to me that you, you um, um, brought in themes from Paul. Uh, this is a quote from you. Students learn best when they're able to follow their passion and operate within the constraints of a bounded environment. It felt to me like this was even in some ways sort of the core conclusion of the book. Uh, information plus experimentation equals play. Right. Yeah, I, I think it is. It, it actually stems from the uh, actually the earlier work in the social life of information. Um, you know, in terms of the epistemological shift to looking much more carefully at social practices and the tacit component. You know, they're they're in. Um, or how do you indwell in a situation, which is having more to do with by being in. Uh, you're starting to connect things subconsciously, uh, and it's that subconscious connections that actually let you make sense out of things. So I think that both indwelling, which plays at the tacit level primarily, um, is something that becomes empowered from the type of immersive learning we're talking about. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the ironic thing is if the tacit is where the guts really live, so to speak, um, you can't be taught to tacit. You've got to be a part of it. You've got to, you've got to be indwelling in it. Uh, and that's what this Im these immersive environments are actually doing. So I think the shift from focusing on the explicit to focusing on the tacit is also a shift from learning about to learning to be. And so, you know, for me, speaking personally, um, you know, I was brought up as a theoretical mathematician uh, originally, and uh, you know, I spent four years of undergraduate and two years of a graduate degree um, learning about mathematics. And then one day, by accident, my professor, who was a moderately famous research mathematician, Paul Hamels by name, got honest to God stuck on the problem. And those of us in the seminar got to watch him struggle. And in that struggle was the first time I got a glimpse of what it mean to be a research mathematician. Um, it was a monumental event in my life. Uh, how I could have spent six years thinking that mathematics was this pure, formal stuff, as opposed to an incredibly messy, intuitive, mucking around with stuff. 
and it's only after you muck around and finally get the idea do you go back and try to prove it in terms of this logical proof. I had it all backwards because I'd never been able to see how a practicing mathematician actually worked. And needless to say, no book um, except proofs and refutation is the one book in the world I know of by Makatosh gets into this. And so that's what got me particularly sensitized to almost a conspiracy theory that we make things seem pure and pristine when in fact they're horribly messy and we just got to in, get in there and mess around. One of the sort of saddest stories for me in the book is the this Doug story of the students and uh, their passion and asking right. them what, what it was they were really passionate about and having the students say, I don't know. Yeah, and, and I think that you know, as, as folks here on, on, on the call and on, on, on the collective here know, um, you know, we're living in a world of um, that our parents are pushing kids to be overachievers. And so the only thing that matters is get um, a fantastic portfolio of the old kind assembled in high school where you've gotten straight A's, you're taking all the right courses, you've gone off and helped charity groups, you've gone off to Brazil, uh, for one summer, dot, 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 as you get into school if you want, as soon as you get into the college if you want, you do the same damn thing. Uh, and so, you know, we are, we are channeling kids to be overachievers in terms of our goals or the goals that they think are required to move ahead. And almost never are these kids now taking out time to say, what do I really find interesting? What turns me on? And I got to tell you that the universities I talk to over the world, uh, and I, in fact, find the right way to frame this kind of question in, that, in their kind of the genre, so to speak, um, nearly all of them say, I didn't know. I mean, and, and professors left, right, and sideways now saying, yet yeah, today's kids don't think about what is their passion and interest. They think about what's on the test. How do I get an A plus? And so on. So, Connie, we'll give you the first question. We're not, they're not there yet, but we're darn close. Um, so, uh, I want to read one quick section from the book. You've alluded to it, but I think it's worth really noting. You say, imagine an environment where participants are constantly measuring and evaluating their own performances, even if that requires them to build new tools to do it. Imagine an environment where user interface dashboards are individually and personally constructed by users to help them make sense of the world and their own on performance in it. Imagine an environment where evaluation is based on after action reviews, not to determine rewards, but to continually enhance performance. Imagine an environment where learning happens on a continuous basis because the participants are internally motivated to find, share, and filter new information on a near constant basis. Well, I read that having read the book a couple of times already, and I still was struck by this next line. Finding an environment like that sounds difficult, but it isn't. It already exists, and in one of the most unlikely places, a new generation of games. So you say, in our view, MMOs, massively multiplayer online games, is that, if I've got yes. that right, right, are the most perfect illustrations of a new learning environment. Right. And then we go on, I think, to explain that, but the... Um, the catch is, if you look at, and I'm going to stick to World of Warcraft, uh, which you know, we've written a lot of papers on, um, you have to look at not the playing of the game per se, that is the center of the game, but again, you have to look at the social life on the edge of the game, the knowledge economy that is built up around the game, um, how um, those guilds function, how groups, high-end raid groups within a guild actually are getting knowledge from everybody in the guild, how they're actually mining new knowledge left, right, and sideways every single night, um, how are they actually absorbing new play, how are they running experiments continually themselves uh, because there's nothing fixed here because this game, these games are always slightly varying um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, our sense is... Um, uh, the numbers in World of Warcraft, you know, they're probably um, you know 12 to 14, maybe more million players. I didn't check where I logged on um, today, um, but they're about 
30 to 50,000 new ideas a day getting posted, you know, including um, videos, cinemas, uh, machinima shots, et cetera, et cetera, that articulate kind of new strategies, new combinations of ideas, so on and so forth. Um, and that all has to be processed within a particular guild in order to become the highest performing uh, high-end raiders um, you know, in the world to compete. Um, and so what you really find here is that is the learning around the edge. It's the knowledge prowling around the edge. It's the constant experimentation. It's the reflections that are going on um, that are happening that lead to this almost knowledge refining with any particular guild within this game space. Um, that's what we think of is very interesting learning environments, very close to what I'm beginning to experience in, in the biological world because we're producing new uh, new insights in biology now, uh, even faster than what Warcraft is, um, albeit they're slightly more scientifically based. <laughs> uh, but you know the flood of knowledge coming in is suddenly you've got to you know, now think about processing that in different different slices of the guild, if you see how these guilds self-organize to partition who's going to look at what, and so on. It's really an amazing learning environment. Peter Singy would be very happy. It reminded me of speaking to students in France this last year where they described all these websites they went to, and I said, well, you know, how many of, out of, how many of these websites are you learning? And out of 40, maybe only two or three. And I said, why? Why is uploading a video not learning? Or why is doing this other thing not learning? And they said, because you're not taking notes. And their description of learning was, that's when you're taking notes. And right. of course, you would have a lot to say about that. OK, we're <laughs> going to move to Q&A. And uh, Connie raised her hand by accident. So I'm going to go to some of the questions that have been asked uh, in the chat. If I've missed the question, I apologize. Feel free to post it again. But I do have three from the chat. And feel free also to use to raise your hand, which look at the bottom of the participant window for the hand with the up arrow. And that would allow you to raise your hand and take the microphone. So the first question that came was from Sid, who says, what are some of the best learning edges in a higher ed that have potential to transform the core? Um, you know, I actually think that the um, the multimedia worlds, the tools we now have, uh, become very effective there. Um, the ability to tell stories in multimedia, the um, ability to kind of make an argument. I mean, think about the very interesting question, which will which will cause teachers to uh, go into a state of hysteria: is um, how do you make a visual argument? Uh, yet, if you know how to make a visual argument, you're going to do well in the corporate world because you only have about 30 seconds to capture somebody's attention in the boardrooms. Um, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> so I think that there's a lot of things like this. But um, Steve, one thing we didn't talk about is this idea about the shift in the in the world we're talking about between content and context. Because in the um, in the 20th century world, the context was pretty much frozen, and it was the content we were constantly focusing on. In the 21st century digital world, its context is playing out as much as content. Um, how do you shape the context to be able to carry the message and so on and so forth? So let me give you a type of assignment that that that, teach, that, that students find fascinating. Uh, think about getting them to remix a fragment of a movie or a whole movie, um, but to change the soundtrack of the movie, put their own soundtrack on. That remixing is pretty easy to do with the tools we have today. Guess what? Uh, you can completely change the meaning of the movie as it gets perceived by changing the audio. More importantly, you actually change what gets seen. Almost nobody realizes, and students are stunned when they find this out, that the context, such as the way that the music is synchronized, affects what you see. Not just what it means to you, but what you actually see. They used to do this around Jurassic Park and take a very dramatic scene about when the, uh, the dinosaur chomps the person. But go back and do a still frame analysis of that. You find out the dinosaur never did. 
it was all communicated by the music track that uh, was playing behind that ascent. So you begin to now see how by thinking about tools to modify context, you are actually changing the meaning and changing well a lot of things besides just the meaning. Now, why do I care about that? Is that happens to be incredibly important for being able to evaluate things you now see in the public sphere. Once you understand how by even shifting the camera angle, which is hard to do post facto, um, but cha changing the music, changing the shading, how it will change what an event seems like when you see it on TV news. You become much more aware, much more inquiry, you know, you begin to ask all kinds of new questions about did he really say that that way? Yes, he said it, but what was the context? Was the context clipped or not? And so you become, I think, much more attuned to how media maybe is shaping, if not manipulating, how we think or what we think is happening in the world. All this, I think, actually makes us much better world citizens. If you have a question for JSB, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. I have a couple of more. Uh, Rob, thanks. I'm going to I'll do one or two before I get to yours. Um, uh, Ken asked, isn't it much easier to immerse a child in computer-generated personalized learning provided at the level, pace, et cetera, that is most appealing to the student? Um, I mean, I think it's a question. I'm not opposed to what Clayton Christensen has argued in disruptive class. Um, I think that that gets, you know, I mean, having a certain base knowledge certainly helps. Although I think you'd be surprised uh, after a certain age how much knowledge kids are capable of picking up on their own. So I think that you know, setting setting up a base knowledge sure helps. Uh, but you'd be surprised how much you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps once you get to a certain level, um, especially if you're used to kind of learning how to kind of think intuitively and learn how to play with things. Uh, you begin to start figuring things out where instead of just kind of absorbing or accepting things being given you, you start manipulating them and see what makes sense. So there's a give and take here. Um, but no, I'm not opposed to uh, to you know, brilliant lectures or um, you know, carefully structured material that helps me rapidly get into an exploratory mode. Durf asks if you feel your book is supported by constructionism or connect connectionism or connectivism. Well, I, I think uh, both of those um, almost epistemological stance is you know, play into what we're saying. We're trying to show what the additional tools are uh, that make that possible and to try to give a sense of how the tacit actually plays out. Um, most people know how to quote uh, Polanyi's opening line, but almost no one understands kind of how the tacit actually works, and especially in terms of a network sense of collective indwelling, which we think is something that has never been kind of touched on by anybody else before. And we see ways now to bring about, you know, accelerated learning environments and have many of the properties that you want to scaffold the kinds of connectionism um, and constructivism that you're talking about. And I mean, after all, I grew up in Logo, so. <laughs> so I think this may be a different question than the previous one, but Rob's asking if you agree with Christensen's concept of disruptive innovations. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot that can be done with what he is saying. Um, I would add on to it intelligent coaching, which is, of course, some of you know that's where I started out originally um, in terms of how you really personalize and look over the shoulder of a student trying to do something. Um, you know, I I still believe that the best examples of teachers that I know are coaches, athletic coaches. And I think we have a phenomenal amount to learn from really expert coaching. 
And I'm surprised that we don't study ex the true expert coaches more in our schools of education or even in our papers on kind of psychology. So Bill asks, and I'm and I'm glad because I think this will let you kind of pull in pull again. What is the corporate world view of the autodidact today? When will corporations start hiring autodidacts versus the credentialed? Um, yeah, I think you're beginning to see more and more of it now because, again, given this pace of change, you're finding that um, a lot of the things that you care about students knowing is less than two years old. Um, and they don't know, and they didn't get taught that in school. So if they don't kind of come in with a questing disposition, they're not going to be very good at picking it up. So I, I think that you know this is becoming more and more important. Um, you know I'm getting asked by a lot of the biggest corporations to come in and talk more about these questing dispositions in terms of learning. Um, and you know I actually just before I got on the phone with you, Steve, finished a little piece for the Financial Times. Um, talking about graphic processing units and how you can't hire anybody who's been through a, f a formal program in how to do that. Uh, yet these are turning out to be a miracle machines for certain classes of problems. Go out and find yourself some students that have this kind of inquisitive attitude, bring them in the summer interns, and let them play. And that may be the most effective way to learn. At least you maybe also, the most effective right. way for the for the for the, for the uh, company to learn uh, what can be done with this. It seems to me, and Paul, you also make the argument that the companies that do a good job of creating environments for personal passions to flower are going to be the ones who ultimately succeed. Right. Yeah, and, and somebody just mentioned uh, the the cello student. Who I think I'm in love with uh, <laughs> in uh, Xander's um, uh, film. I think what it's called, but it's, the producer of it is um, Catalina Gro, who actually um, helped her edit that that, that particular film. But um, you know, it is amazing to see uh, what orchestra, good orchestra leaders and athletic coaches can actually do. I, I actually am a big fan of Coach K at Duke University. Um, and kind of the techniques that he's been developing. So, JSB, that was really terrific. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on. The book is A New Culture of Learning, Cultivating the Imagination for a World of Constant Change. Uh, it's really been a privilege to have you talk to us about it. Thanks again to Learn Central and Illuminate for helping support the interview series. Uh, don't forget tomorrow, if you're interested, Steve Wheeler at an early time, 12 noon Pacific. Uh, Michael Horn on Thursday evening, InnoCite's discussion of North Carolina school connectivity, and then next week uh, we launch into whole new things, including the rescheduled Kevin Kelly session. Thanks so much, JSB. Thank you. Great. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Delightful evening. I uh, sure hope you had fun. I did. Uh, we do finish right at the top of the hour in order to allow our guests to go, uh, but you're welcome to stick in the chat for a few more minutes and, and talk to each other. Yeah, I am going to clap here. really should have done that earlier. There's the clapping icon at the bottom of the participant window. <laughs> Great. And, uh, and then I'll turn the recording off now and uh, in about five minutes ask you to leave the room so the recording can process. Thanks to John Seeley Brown. Thanks to all of you. Have a great evening or day depending on where you are. Thank you.